It's uh, kind of appropriate we're in the basement to talk about something a little bit more low level than, uh, than application code. Uh, my name's Clay. I work for New Relic. I'm a developer advocate there. I'm joined by my colleague Jeff Martins, uh, who's the browser PM up front. You should definitely say hi to Jeff. And, uh, you know, today I'm going to be giving you a kind of an introduction to this new thing called HTTP2. And I think the why of a talk is always really important. And personally, I think that this new protocol, the successor to the previous version, HTTP 1.1, has really important implications for the future of the web and also APIs as well. And whether or not we as a community end up adopting it or it becomes the new IPv6 where, you know, it's 10 years later and it's, you know, only 30% of people are using it, really depends on the community and everybody in this room. And one of the massive hurdles to HTTP2 adoption, especially um, for someone with my background who's very focused on application development, is the protocol itself is very difficult to understand. It's very complex, there's quite a lot going on, and that in turn uh, has a lot of really big implications on how we actually build uh, web applications, but also REST APIs and mobile applications. And this talk ultimately is just an introduction to what it all means, uh, using some candy, it's true, and it's an attempt uh, by me to kind of explain it and, uh, and help people understand, you know, how it might impact your day-to-day -day job, if not now, maybe in six months or a year. It's uh, broken up into three parts here. The first is an introduction to the protocol itself. Uh, the second is how HTTP2 is kind of changing web performance best practices. So we know how it works. What does that actually mean for me as someone who builds or writes software for the web? And then part three is a little bit of debugging. I, I think if you're brave enough to actually start implementing it, you really need to know the tools of how you actually can inspect it and know what's going on. And uh, that's, that itself, it's still quite early, is, is pretty, um, pretty rudimentary. So one of the really big goals, and I'll, I'll be really happy, is if the end of this presentation, this makes sense. Why is HTTP 2 like a party punch flavor Twizzler pull and peel? And why is HTTP 1.1 like a Sour Patch Kids rope? I really hope to explain, you know, why this metaphor is useful for understanding the construction differences between the two protocols, and why in general people are saying, oh, HTTP 2, it's a lot faster, it's improved, it's a lot more advanced. Uh, we can use it to build faster web apps. I think it's really important to get uh, simple definitions out of the way. I, I think probably everyone in here has built software for the web before, but simple English Wikipedia always comes to the rescue. And that's that ultimately this is a protocol, it's a communications protocol, and HTTP 1.1, as we know, anyone who's looked at the Chrome Web Inspector, is just a way to send and receive web pages and files on the internet. And that's how it was actually created back in the mid-90s by Tim Berners-Lee, and we're really still stuck with that. But uh, as you've known, uh, HTTP 1.1 and the protocol itself is now used all over the place. Internet of Things, mobile phones, mobile APIs, and uh, REST APIs, and, inner, and even uh, like inner microservice communication is often done in HTTP. In HTTP. And that's because it's so well understood and basically every single programming language has some sort of HTTP client or server. So it's been adopted all over the place and that's really nice as people that write software. Uh, that said, um, and this is kind of obvious, that HTTP 1.1, the protocol, is nearly 20 years old. So I've chosen a nice Netscape Navigator theme for this uh, slide. And it sounds really dated, but back in the late 90s, you could say, yes, HTTP 1.1 is the main application protocol of the information superhighway, and people really wouldn't look at you that weird. And one of the really, really great things about HTTP 1.1, uh, as it was conceived in the 90s, was that it was simple. You can actually still do this today, uh, and I think many of you have probably done this, but if you use the Telnet tool, which is just a way to send text over TCP, you go to forward.js or google.com on port 80, you can actually physically type on your keyboard human readable HTTP commands and get responses back. You can add headers, and that's really, um, that's really simplified the way people have built clients and servers, because ultimately, hey, it's just text, you can read that yourself, you can read it in a debugging tool, you can read it over the wire, and it's been very easy to kind of build this massive infrastructure, which, by the way, powers the entire internet and the web, uh, because it's a very simple and understandable protocol. Uh, however, since the late 90s, since Netscape Navigator was the browser you used, uh, there have been a lot of changes in the web itself. The first, which is no surprise to everybody here, 
is that yes, we keep writing more and more JavaScript. Uh, HTParchive.org has great stats on this, always, always interesting to look at. It goes about, back about six years. But from 2010 to 2016, yes, the trend is clear. We're making more JavaScript requests. That's requests to deliver JavaScript to web applications. And the size of that JavaScript is also increasing as well. Uh, the second thing, and it's absolutely related, is that yes, uh, in the past six years and absolutely since the late 90s, we're sending more and more bytes over the wire. Uh, that's JavaScript, CSS, uh, everyone's favorite web fonts, um, images, of course, and, and HTML markup as well. So, you know, it keeps going up. The number of requests keep going up. This graph is a little bit deceptive, but in, uh, in 2010, it was about 50 requests on the top Alexa top 100 sites. Now it's closer to, let me see if I can read this, uh, closer to 90. So more stuff over the wire, more JavaScript, more and more everything built on top of a now 20-year-old web application protocol. And uh, as people have wisely pointed out, this is a great talk. I'll, I'll share the slides later. I highly encourage everyone takes a look at these slides. Yes, we're kind of in the middle of this website obesity crisis. The pages we go to, even for very simple and straightforward con um, content, is um, is uh, all over the place. You know, it's it's not uncommon to go to a web page and then be faced with um, I don't know, uh, you know, two megabytes to read a text article. Uh, all that said, uh, at the lower level, down in the basement on the protocol level, HP 1.1 is still parting like it's 1997. And it's kind of incredible and to the credit of the web community and people that write software that we're even able to build these really interesting things on this dated protocol. So in 20, 2009, November 2009, Google comes along and posts this blog post. Uh, which I've rendered in Chrome 5, the, the, the best browser of its day in 2009. Uh, but the idea here is that, you know, they said, they dropped this bomb and said, hey, we're researching this new thing called Speedy. In lab settings, we're seeing web pages that are loading up to 50% faster using all of these really clever tricks. And this is absolutely the basis of this talk and kind of the historical background that kind of has led us to HTTP2, which absolutely uh, came out of research Google started with Speedy. So, uh, final historical note before we actually go into the protocol itself, uh, was ratified by the Internet Engineering Task Force in May of 2015, and it's slowly being adopted by different clients and servers all over the world. For, on the browser side, according to caniuse.com, that stands at about 62%. Every modern browser, Chrome, uh, uh, Firefox, uh, Safari, both mobile, and uh, desktop and, um, and uh, IE Edge all support it. So more and more browsers can talk and understand HTTP2. That uh, kind of leads us to the second part of the talk and well, like what is this HTTP2 thing and how does it work? And you know, why does it lead to these performance benefits? I think it's really important to understand the why it makes things faster. And it's actually kind of clever too how they did it. So uh, let's start with those two pieces of candy, but we've, haven't unwrapped the pieces of candy yet. The reason they're wrapped is they're in a TLS wrapper. HTTP2 is required by all browsers to be sent over HTTPS. So over the wire, and this is really important because over the wire, let's say you're some, uh, you're some application proxy in a corporate network that hasn't been updated in 10 years. That proxy doesn't know it's HTTP2 or HTTP 1.1 over TLS because it's all encrypted. So because HTTP2 and HTTP 1.1 are wrapped in TLS, all of these devices that have no idea or no conception of HTTP2 work perfectly well. It's only when the traffic is decrypted on the browser and server side that the client and server code actually knows what it is. And so if we unwrap it, if we unwrap the TLS, we're ultimately looking at these two pieces of candy. And yes, it's kind of obvious the Twizzler pull and peel party punch flavor is a little bit more complex and it uh, has a different construction, but we can imagine both of these as communication, as uh, application protocol data going over a single TLS connection for both. And if we unwrap that Twizzler pull and peel, we see many different streams. And that's kind of the, the key <laughs> insight here, is that if once we unwrap it, we see all these different color streams, and all of those streams are where messages are sent. And messages are just the gets, the posts, the deletes, all of the HTTP verbs, the response code, and the data that come through client and server communication. And so we've unwrapped it, 
there are multiple streams, and a single connection can have multiple streams. The streams have an ID, and most critically, and this is the really cool thing, the streams can actually have priorities and also dependencies. So one really cutting edge uh, piece of this new protocol is that it's now possible for clients to tell servers that one stream is more important than another stream, or one stream can potentially depend on another stream. Uh, if we go even deeper though, streams isn't it, uh, streams themselves are composed of frames, which the spec calls kind of the fundamental unit of HTTP2. Think of it like the, the kind of the atomic level of the application protocol. And so if we look at uh, these messages, the get post, which map, by the way, perfectly to the standard get post, the standard messages in HTTP 1.1, uh, you see there, instead of being just blobs of text that we sent over Telnet, they're now actually composed of individual binary frames. And this is the really cool thing about HTTP2 in general. This is why it's faster. It's this binary framing layer. So if we actually inspect these messages and these frames that belong to these streams over the wire, we see they're all interweaved. And we have different frames with different types that belong to different streams. And then the client and the server reassemble these, stream, these binary frames into messages. And then the application code picks them up. Great, you're good to go. You've got to get a post. Uh, you've got to get, you've got to post. Here's the data. The frames, and I really want to underscore this, this entire layer, this construction of the protocol, how it's done in binary frames, is absolutely fundamental to all of the performance increases. Google and the researchers uh, in the IETF came up with this very, very clever, and I, I think personally kind of cool way, to reframe HP1 semantics using this binary layer, and it turns out there are some pretty significant performance benefits uh, by doing that. And because of that, it turns out, unfortunately, uh, you know, that kind of changes a lot of the assumptions we've had as a community in the past uh, 10 years if, like, if we were to flip the HP2 switch on tomorrow. It just changes a lot of the assumptions we've made about how to build fast web pages. And a, a brief aside just about latency, and this is why one of the new features of HP2 is such a big deal, and that's, you know, information can't travel faster than the speed of light, and if you're sending a bit from one side of the world to another, that absolutely has a cost, just to transmit the data. And especially over long distances, this web has become more global, as, you know, people are accessing APIs and websites on a global audience, the cost of moving those HTTP requests and responses over TCP absolutely comes at a cost. And so if we imagine there was this, you know, hypothetical, perfect, uh, great circle distance fiber optic cable from San Francisco to Cape Town, and we just wanted to send a single bit one direction, that's still 79 milliseconds. And magnified over an entire web page uh, with requests and responses, so we're talking round trips now, so round trip, double that, it becomes very, very noticeable to people that are using web applications. And that cost of setting up a TCP connection, the cost of actually, you know, creating that connection from point A to point B, absolutely comes at a cost that's, that's, uh, that is due to this latency. And so the idea behind HP2 is that we can now use that TCP connection in a much smarter way. Because the binary frames can now be interweaved and you can have multiple streams in the same connection that, by the way, don't block each other, it means that using a single TCP connection, you can send many different messages, including the message data and responses, back and forth, which ends up being really, really huge because HP 1.1 is kind of built with that assumption that, you know what, we've got to absolutely minimize the total number of connections. So this entire class of web performance hacks or best practices to reduce the number of TCP connections on a web page, uh, they kind of get thrown out the window in a hypothetical world where everything is HTTP2. CSS concatenation, JavaScript concatenation, inlighting assets, kind of like, you know, we've seen this where people like inject the base64 of an image into the HTML source so you can re reduce a request, or you bundle a mass amount of JavaScript files like the giant's, you know, two megabyte application.js or application.css. That doesn't become necessary anymore because all of those requests to the same host that it requests those assets now can be very intelligently uh, uh, used over the, the, over the same TCP connection without blocking. Uh, same thing for domain sharding, which is a hack uh, that just uh, dealt with um, spreading request assets over many subdomains to kind of get around a browser limit to the number of open TCP connections per host. But uh, that's a huge opportunity for web developers because 
in this world where we can unbundle these giant bundled assets, whether it's image spriting, CSS, or JavaScript, it allows you to cache uh, in, in the uh, you know, hypothetical best case scenario, many different small pieces of your application. So when visitors return to the sites and they want to get you know, some, you know, the version of jQuery you've been using for two years, they'll already have it in the cache and if you change one byte of JavaScript, it doesn't invalidate the entire application JS. So it allows for much smaller pieces of the application to be cached in a more intelligent way, which, um, which has some really great uh, implications. The second thing, which I don't go into, is kind of, it reduces the operational bur burden. I don't know how many people have seen, you know, the thousand line grunt file that, you know, combines and concatenates and minifies JavaScript source. It hypothetically reduces the operational complexity of putting assets on web pages. We can just, you know, throw some more uh, script tags and then the protocol layer will handle that in a much better way. If we've unbundled, and I think Khan Academy Engineering had a great post on this, it does have one uh, downside, and that's that compression, uh, compression comp performance uh, will be impacted. So using Zlib, it's much more efficient to compress one single giant JavaScript or CSS file, and that same file broken up into 100 different bits. So as, you're as you unbundle, and as you're measuring the total page size, uh, you've really got to watch out for that and make sure that you know, your total page request size isn't uh, drastically impacted, as it was with uh, Khan Academy. Uh, last cool new feature before I go into uh, some security stuff is header compression. This was a massive feature that was lacking in HP 1.1. But as we've added more cookies, security headers, and everything else, in HTTP 2, those headers can now be compressed, and the standard HPAC is part of the, um, part of the standard it says, it itself. So implication there is all of that header data now compressed, less bytes over the wire, your total, um, you know, your total page size and number of requests to build it uh, gets reduced. So really cool stuff there. And as I said before, um, one really important thing, and, and one thing that I think is going to be a challenge for people implementing this that don't already have HBS, is that it's absolutely required. And that's great. You know, we want to build a more secure web. You know, different thought leaders are saying, you know, HBS should be on by default. So that's all great. But it actually has uh, a, another technical reason behind it, and that's that uh, the TLS has an extension called ALPN. And ALPN is, again, uh, another very clever hack, or not hack, I shouldn't say hack, another clever, <laughs> clever protocol extension to allow the client and the server to determine what application protocol to speak without additional round trips. So when that TLS connection is established between a client and a server, and you can actually do this on the command line using OpenSSL, sorry it won't work on a Mac, you need to use Linux or upgrade your OpenSSL client version, we can actually query, uh, you can query the client uh, with this next proto neg uh, option, uh, no, um, no other, just empty quotes, and it'll actually say what protocols are advertised uh, by the server. And that's huge because when the client makes the connection to the server, they can determine whether to talk in Speedy, uh, the HTTP2 uh, predecessor, HTTP 1.1, or uh, the new stuff with HTTP 2. Uh, so the TLS required option has some really important performance benefits, and that's why a lot of browser vendors have gone with that. In addition to, yes, we do want to make the web a more secure place. If you're kind of worried about the certificate cost and you know, the, the pain and process of getting a new TLS certificate, uh, some quick free advice. Um, Let'sEncrypt.org uh, is now in beta, free SSL certificates, very great, and they've really done a great job of making that process of getting a certificate and adding it to your server software as straightforward as possible. I think it's, it's a great thing for the web. Uh, one thing if you're a business, um, you'll probably end up wanting to pay, although nothing's really stopping you from using Let's Encrypt. But uh, one option worth considering uh, when getting a certificate for your business site, if it doesn't have HBS, is whether you want to go with an extended validation certificate, an EV certificate. And that's also just known as that giant green bar when you go to a banking website that says, front and center, here's my business name. Uh, not, uh, not discussed here, but still really cool. Could be entirely separate talks streams, server-side push, the ability of servers to send data um, to clients before the client requests it. Extremely cool, very cutting edge. People are just ex now experimenting with it. Request prioritization, I kind of discussed, but the idea that you can prioritize some assets and some requests before others, very interesting, still very early. 
And then, you know, we've talked about frame types, but there are over 10, there are 10 different HP2 frame types, including like ping and reset, uh, window update. Those are all very interesting, but kind of beyond the scope of this introductory talk. If you're interested in more, um, there's a great uh, kind of article introduction by the creator of Curl, which I recommend. So if that, like, if that hasn't terrified you at this point, um, I want to talk about just very practical debugging. Let's say you want to roll this out on your development server, your staging server, you know, make your blog speak HTTP2. You're pretty much going to end up needing to use Wireshark at this point until uh, tools like Charles and other debugging proxies catch up. But it's really not that bad. It's just a lot of steps to get it to decrypt the traffic because, as we said before, it's all over HBS. Uh, step one is for Chrome and Firefox, you've got to set this environment variable called SSS keylog. You know, you give it a log file name, uh, link to the tutorial, and that's going to capture the RSA pre master keys, which I'm not entirely <laughs> sure what that is. But anyway, it puts the information you need in a log file, and then in Wireshark, you open up settings. You say, hey, Wireshark, here's my secret that you need to decrypt the traffic so I can actually see what's going on. You plop it in there, you click OK, and then you start capturing. And uh, since it's all over HBS, that's port 443. You set it up to point at point 443, you choose your uh, network interface card, and you might have tried a couple times, but eventually uh, you'll see all of the individual binary frames, which is actually kind of cool. And I know it's hard to read, but you actually see all of the different levels you have to drill down to actually see the data. So in this case, I'm looking at a header frame, which is just header data associated with a message. First of all, it's encrypted. Uh, second of all, it's compressed. And if you decrypt it, uh, decompress it, then you actually see the text which is just your standard headers, which you recognize uh, from just normal stuff. So a lot of steps, interface, kind of rough around the edges, but it is possible to kind of get down to that level. I will suggest uh, one simpler option, and that's just to use Chrome. Uh, unfortunately, it's harder to understand than the Wireshark interface, which is, <laughs> which is interesting. But if you go to uh, Chrome Net Internals, there's an HP2 uh, option. And uh, Rebecca Murphy has created a really cool NPM package that actually can visualize that data. By, um, by default, it's, um, it's just one giant text blob, but there is a visualizer. And I think we're going to see lots more um, you know, higher level and easier to use tools going forward. So that brings up kind of the elephant in the room. Great, HTTP2 is cool. It makes my site faster, probably. Uh, well, what do I do about all of the people on old versions of IE or, or Firefox or, or people using, you know, old Android browsers? And that brings up really, really difficult questions. Uh, you can either just build only for HTTP 2 and HTTP 1.1 clients will be penalized uh, if you optimize for HTTP 2. You create two versions of the site, so one for each client, which is a massive operational undertaking, not, not only in how you build your site, or you wait for broader support. I, I think these are the three things that keep coming up when, when discussing like kind of practical implementations. Uh, if that hasn't uh, dissuaded you, uh, the real question then is, well, you know, how do you, how do you eat this HTTP2 performance candy? Most major servers in their latest version supported Apache, Nginx, IAS in the 2016 tech preview. Heroku, uh, not yet. Um, Google App Engine, not surprisingly from Google, does support it. Amazon S3, uh, not yet either. And if you're uh, kind of shaking your head like, you know, it'll, it'll take two years to upgrade my Apache or Nginx or IIS instance, uh, there's a really compelling CDN option. And that's that, you know, CDNs and different providers support this in different ways can potentially just talk to HTTP2 to browsers that support it. And then the connection between your CDN and your origin servers is just in HTTP 1.1. So potentially a, um, a very fast way to get started, especially you know, if for uh, stuff served over a CDN. Um, you're seeing more and more support, and a lot of CDN providers are kind of leading advocacy uh, in this area. That leads us with uh, you know, where is it today? You know, how fast is this being adopted? Is this you know, the new um, you know, Windows ME or something? Well, it, it's not nearly as popular as ETag compression, but you can see in this graph, it is getting used in very high traffic sites, Google and Twitter. Uh, and WordPress and uh, Cloudflare has basically turned it on. So you're seeing increased adoption in traffic sites and also in the number of sites. And hopefully, depending on um, how it's received by developers and implementers, uh, we'll see it move uh, up and to the right. 
you know, that, that said, I, I just want to end on a note that, you know, if you look at all your users of whatever application you're building, even if that application's all developers, uh, people ultimately really don't care <laughs> what protocol you're using. They just want it to work and it to be fast. And I think in a lot of cases, uh, HV2 is a way to improve customer experience and to, to make things faster and to kind of push the web forward, especially as it becomes more global and there are more mobile devices and latency kind of becomes more of an issue. But ultimately, uh, you know, these decisions should never be made, you know, because HP2 is shiny or it's faster. It's like, you know, is this actually going to help people who are using my site and make it faster and better? And, uh, you know, on that note, uh, thanks, thanks very much. And, uh, you know, end with a pun, HP2 is sweet. And uh, I'll have my slides posted uh, very, very shortly. Um, there's also a, a blog post that goes in a little more detail at bit.ly, HP2 candy. Uh, thanks very much.